The human soul was threshed out like a maze in the endless granary of defeated actions, of mean things that happened to the very edge of endurance and beyond, and not only death, but many deaths came to each one. Each day a tiny death, dust, worm, a light flicked off in the mud at the city's edge, a tiny death with coarse wings, pierced into each man like a short lance, and the man was besieged by the bread or by the knife. The cattle dealer, the child of sea harborers, or the dock captain of the plow, or the rag picker of snarled streets, everybody lost heart, anxiously waiting for death, the short death of every day, and the grinding bad luck of every day was like a black cup that they drank with their hands shaking. These are the lines from Heights of Machu Picchu, published in 1946 by the Spanish poet Pablo Neruda. Time and again in this course, I've asked that we understand the biography of the writer and the culture of the writer's heritage when approaching world literature, especially the literature of Latin America and the Caribbean. Yet I don't mean to suggest that literature is only or merely a vehicle for politics, or for autobiography. Literature is also an aesthetic, a thing of beauty, as I think those lines I just read suggest. In the writing of Pablo Neruda, we see the merger of the cultural and the aesthetic, particularly we see in the long poem, The Heights of Machu Picchu, this merger. Let's take a look for a moment at the history of the site of the poem. Built on the edge of 3,000-foot cliffs, Machu Picchu is the most inaccessible corner of perhaps the most inaccessible region of the central Andes Mountains. Located in present-day Peru, Machu Picchu is a magnificent artifact of Inca civilization, the monument of temples and stairways that have survived intact. The relic was rediscovered by Hiram Brigham in 1911 on, a, on a, an archaeological expedition from Yale. I think we need to be very careful about talking about discovery and rediscovery. Obviously, the natives knew it was here. There was a, um, a, an expedition in 1902 as well, but Hiram Brigham popularized uh, the finding of Machu Picchu. Well, the relic, of course, survived almost intact, and it inspired Pablo Neruda toward a meditation on the glory and honor of human achievement. Yet, as evident in the lines I read to you earlier, Neruda demonstrates profound empathy not with, not with the ruins themselves or as an artifact of a lost civilization, but with the workers with those who built the ruins. Neruda's poem celebrates not only the remnant of a glorious empire, but ready, rather it serves as a reminder of thousands of dead workers who built the monument. Uh, Neruda was a communist, yes. He joined the communist parties during the 1940s, was elected to the Chilean Senate, was forced to flee the country in political exile. But he doesn't approach communism as merely an intellectual exercise. Notice in those lines that I read, he focuses, he rivets his attention on those human beings who are impacted by empire. He attempts to visualize through language. This attention to visualization, to, to making us actually see, is also achieved in another of his poems, a quite famous one, The United Fruit Company. Here are the opening lines to that poem. When the trumpets had sounded and all was in readiness on the face of the earth, Jehovah divided his universe. Anaconda, Ford Motors, Coca-Cola Incorporated, and similar entities. The most succulent item of all, the United Fruit Company Incorporated, reserves for itself the heartland and coasts of my country, the delectable waste of America's. His heartland, of course, being chilly. Here the poet is critical of the multinational interests that have seized control of his country, the corporations that run Chile. But again, note the imagery here as if Chile itself is being ravished by these corporations. I, I think that as much as, as any writer that we're studying in this section of the course, and Pablo Neruda is one of my, my favorite poets, so perhaps as much as any writer I know, uh, he took his obligation, his responsibility very seriously as, as a poet. And in fact, addresses that in one poem called Poet's Obligation. Here's the opening lines there. To whoever is not listening to the sea this Friday morning, to whoever is cooped up in house or office, factory or woman, a street or mine, or harsh prison cell, to him I come. 
and without speaking or looking, I arrive and open the door of his prison, and a vibration starts up vague and insistent. A great fragment of thunder sets in motion, the rumble of the planet and the foam, the raucous river of the ocean flood. The star vibrates swiftly in its corona, and the sea is beating, dying, continuing. The poem ends by the poet saying, and I shall broadcast saying nothing, the starry echoes of the wave, a breaking up of foam and of quicksand, a rustling of salt withdrawing, a gray cry of seabirds on the coast. So through me, freedom in the sea will make their answer to the shuttered heart. The sea continues on. Here the poet, I think, is a messenger. Uh, we can feel in these lines, I think, the, the influence of the American poet Walt Whitman, who wrote in his life work, Leaves of Grass, these lines, I, I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume you shall assume, what every atom belonging to me is good belongs to you. But with Whitman, I think Neruda believes he's a messenger, and the essence of his message is, is found in the closing lines of those poems. Uh, 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 so through me, freedom in the sea will make their answer to the shuttered heart. Um, but with Whitman, I think Neruda is the poet of the oppressed and the bearer of freedom to those oppressed. Um, what was Neruda about uh, as an individual and as a poet? Um, uh, shortly <coughs> after, after his death in 1973, his memoirs came out posthumously. Um, and th this, this section from those memoirs tells us a lot about w what his aim was as a poet. He writes, these memoirs are intermittent and at times forgetful, for that's the way life is. Many of my memories have faded away as I evoke them, have turned to dust like crystal irrevocably shattered. The usual author of memoirs may well have lived less intensely than I, but he took more snapshots and pleases us with an abundancy of detail. The poet, on the other hand, gives us a gallery of ghosts shaken by fire and the darkness of his times. Perhaps I did not live in myself. Perhaps I lived the life of others. The pages of these memoirs are like a forest or vineyard in the fall. They give forth yellow leaves and grapes ready to live again in the sacred wine. This is a life made up of other lives, for a poet has many lives. It's, it's interesting to me that I've, I've used so much of Neruda's words here and, and very few of my own in analysis, uh, preferring, I think, to let you hear the poet's voice. It's no wonder that he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1971. The, the second writer from Chile I want to talk about is another of my favorites, Isabel Allende. And they're conducted, I think, by more than artistry. They're also linked through the presidency of Salvador Allende, the president of Chile, who was overthrown in a violent revolution in 1973. And I spoke to you about that in a previous lecture. Neruda supported Allende's presidency, believing him to be a leader that would bring reform to his beloved Chile. Uh, Isabel Allende is the niece, of course, of Salvador Allende. And though she remained in Chile after the revolution, she eventually fled in 1975. Uh, this is what she wrote about her flight. When I left Chile after the military coup, I lost in one instant my family, my past, my home. If there had been no exile, no pain, no rage built up over all those years far from my country, most likely I would not have written this book, the book that she's talking about there, is, is a, a particular book we'll turn to in a minute, The House of the Spirits, but, a, but another. Um, she didn't write for a while, but in 1981, her grandfather, her beloved grandfather, was dying, and she sat down to write him a letter. She says, my grandfather thought people died only when you forgot them, and I wanted to prove to him that I had forgotten nothing, that his spirit was going to live with us forever. This letter grew to the 500 pages of the House of the Spirits and was published in 1982 in Spain, translated into English in 1985. I remember when this came out, and this novel was absolutely sensational, as was the case of 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. The House of the Spirits was a vast success. It was made into a major film in 1994. In bringing the political tragedy of Chile to the international attention, Alendia became the first woman to join what had, I suppose, heretofore been an exclusive male club of Latin American novelists, the New York Times said in 1985. For all students who want to know something of the talent and technique of Isabel Allende, I suggest the short story Phantom Palace. 
It's from the short story collection, The Stories of Eva Luna. Um, here are the opening lines from that story to give you a flavor of what she's about. When five centuries earlier, the bold renegades from Spain in their bone-weary horses and armor, candescent beneath an American sun's, stepped upon the shores of Kinora, Indians had been living and dying in that same place for several thousand years. The conquistadors announced with heralds and banners the discovery of a new land, declared its possession of a remote emperor, set in place the first cross, and named the place San Geronimo, a name unpronounceable to the natives. The Indians observed these arrogant ceremonies with some amazement, but the news had already reached them of the bearded warriors who advanced across the world with their thunder of iron and powder. They had heard wherever these men went, they sowed sorrow in that no known people had been capable of opposing them. All, army, all armies had succumbed before that handful of centaurs. Um, but as I told you before, very careful with our language about who discovered and rediscovered, and certainly Allende is taking that to task here. Fanta Palace is the story of conquest of Spanish over the Indians, but also of a particular individual, El Benefactor, an old tyrant of that country over Marcia Lieberman, the young wife of an ambassador. Marcia is attracted to El Benefactor because of his power. El Benefactor is attracted to the elegance of Marcia Lieberman. As the relationship deteriorates, as it must, Marcia finds herself drawn to the summer palace of El Benefactor, a structure dense in the forest. There dwell the Indians, uh, alive in the palace both in spirit and in substance. Um, Marcia herself comes to rest in this place, absorbed in the greenness, Seande writes, clothed only in her tunic, her hair cut short, her body adorned with tattoos and feathers. She was entirely happy. Of course, we can feel in this story what's called before magic realism, that blend of the fantastic and the historic. The method pioneered by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, but Allende is more than that. It's important to recognize that she contributes to female characters, and she draws them as they are vivid, strong, and memorable. And in this, her contribution as a Latin American writer is unique.